there in Acts chapter 2 and just kind of go there and hang out there and, and we are going to uh, kind of walk through. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about the Holy Spirit gives believability to the believers. And um, have, you ever, have you ever noticed, um, like, like today, I received a, just a kind text um, from one, a, a man that one of our men has, has influenced his life. That doesn't happen Y'all, please listen to me. That doesn't happen unless there's believability. Sometimes when words come out of your mouth and words come out of my mouth in our Christianity, they are either being taken and set to the side or they're being impactful. The reason that we're not winning the world around us to Christ is because our words fall into the ground. They do not resonate. Now, I do not believe that apostolic powers still exist. Um, I believe that Paul was the last of the apostles. He was the last one. In fact, I find it very interesting that he told one of the churches, you don't want me coming in power. You've never laid eyes on me, but you would much rather me come to you in word than in power. Paul was the last apostle to have the power to bring blindness to somebody. Acts chapter 13. He was the last one to look at somebody and said, oh, thou child of the devil, full of subtlety, and the man was struck with blindness. He was it. After that, we don't possess that. But we still possess the same Holy Spirit. And the power is not found since Paul's passing. The power is not found to where you and I can touch somebody to heal them physically. That power is found to where spiritually, you and I ought to be impacting somebody's world. And there is a reason why it doesn't happen in our life. It just is. There's a reason why we're not impactful in our marriages. There's a reason why we're not impactful in our families. There's a reason why our neighbors don't take us seriously. Our coworkers don't take us seriously. We, we don't leave behind turning the world upside down. It's not that we don't have the power on the inside. You have all of the Holy Ghost you're ever going to get. And that's not just a saying. That is the truth. Then why? Why is there no footprint and fragrance to where friends are changing friends' worlds? Boyfriends are changing girlfriends' worlds. Moms are changing children's world. There, there ha there's a disconnect. And, and for a long time, it bothered me. Why are my words not powerful? Anybody can put on a good game. Anybody can take charisma and add it to words. Anybody can amp up and ramp up a crowd. Give me the right music, we can get it done. Give me the right story. Let me create the right narrative at the beginning of the sermon and then let me pull in a tearjerker at the very end. I can get anybody to move. This is not what Christianity is. Christianity and the Holy Ghost that lives on the inside of us should so be evident that when we walk away, somebody stands there and they look at us in a different light, knowing, and we'll pull from Acts chapter 2 here before we pray, aren't these men of Galilee? They look so normal. And you were never meant to live and to die and not make an impact for Jesus Christ. 
nobody here was meant to be a hermit. Everybody was meant to be on the forefront of Christianity. And I think the reason churches lose that significance in the community is because the believers lose that significance in their own worlds, me included. Let's walk through the text tonight and let's talk about the fact that the Holy Spirit gives believability to the believers. Heavenly Father, Lord, I have looked at the lesson frontwards and backwards. I have enjoyed my study. There's about four or five more lessons I am really desiring to give. And Lord, we're, we're marching down to where the end of what we're trying to do is for people to get saved. But more than that, for people's lives to be so transformed that you are lifted up so high that there's a magnitude of you being so high that there's a magnet that just draws people. You told us, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And Lord, that's what we want. And may we take it seriously. There is no expertise that any of us bring to the table that we can by step this step. We can't do it. We can't step around it. This is the book. This is the word. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I want you to kind of jump into the text and, and don't read ahead and uh, in your spirit, just although it's familiar. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when, they were, and when this was noised abroad, uh, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And this is what I alluded to here just a moment ago. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. And then it lists the nations that were there, verse 12. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? And others mocking said, These are men full of new wine. So, so when we walk through, I've given you the outline. And by the way, the outline you're looking at is the exact outline that my sermon notes are. So let's kind of walk through here. And I've kind of, where I've expanded the verses in my outline, I have not done so here. We're going to study the relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? And the private work. That first blank there is private. And the private work he does in us and on us before he does a public work through us. There is this disconnect where we think that the Holy Spirit is going to be able to do the work he needs to do in the world around us without us. It's, it's almost like you put a power source on this side, a wire sticking out, and then you put where it's supposed to be connected. And it's almost as if we don't understand why is there no power well, the reason is, is because we're staying in six, week, six feet away spiritually from the receptacle. It's, it's almost like we stand back here with the cord and the receptacle's against the wall. That's where the power's at. And we hold it in our hand and we're flipping on the switch going, why isn't that song working? Why isn't my knocking the door or witnessing? What is going on to where there is no impact? The, the Holy Spirit, you're going to find out, and this is what we're going to be looking at. There is a private work that he needs to do in you and on you so that he now can work through you. Go to Romans chapter 10. This is not in my notes, um, but, but right now it's, it's where I think the Spirit wants us to go. Romans chapter 10. It gives us the, the conclusion in chapter 10 and verse number 13. It says this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that true or not true? Then he gives us the premise, how then shall they call? So yes, it is true. Anybody who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to be saved. But then the premise is asked, how then? He asks a series of questions. How then shall they call in him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a what? 
preacher. So the conclusion is drawn. Yes, they'll, they'll, anybody who calls on Christ will be saved. Absolutely. Then he says, but how is this going to get done unless they believe? And how is this going to get done unless they hear? And how are they going to hear without a what? Preacher. It's easy to sit back and rest on our salvation and say this, well, I don't know why. There is a reason why Acts chapter 2 is put there in relation to the, the early church, not the beginning church, but the early church to where all of a sudden it was like, what just happened? Because 11 days, 40 days, they now are 50 days, if you will, past the Passover in 50 days, it went from 11 to 3,000. How in the world did that happen? Because of the apostles? Intermittently. But because the apostles knew, there's the power, there's the lost, let's plug it in. And the only reason a believer is ineffective with your Christianity, the only reason I am ineffective with my Christianity to where my words, my, my words like just then, like my words, my words fall flat, it's not my fault, it's that little drink, where my words fall flat is not because of anything other than I'm not credible. I'm not believable. And you are working jobs and you are interacting with people that that is your mission field and people ought to be walking past you going, I need the Lord. So when you walk through here, the relationship with the Holy Spirit, there's a private work he wants to do in and on us before he does a public work. The second thing, and I made it easy on you so you didn't have to write anything down. We should never take for granted the foundational teaching of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the third lesser of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is the third and equal part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit as God indwells every believer. Now let me stop. We don't believe in modalism. What we mean by that is God has not transferred from the Father than when the Son was there, from the Son to the Holy Spirit. We don't believe that. We believe God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all God. They are three in one. And if you can find anybody who can explain it to where you can totally understand it, they've not explained it. Because you can't explain God. He is past finding out. That's why it's called faith. But know this. The Holy Spirit right now is playing a role in the church age because when the Trinity existed in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God, Elohim, plurality, in the beginning, let us make, let us make man in our own image, Genesis chapter 1. You're going to find out in Genesis chapter 2, you're going to find out the Trinity existed back before the world ever was created. This was a collective effort by God and the Godhead in the Trinity. So as they marched along, Jesus came to earth. The Spirit and God the Father stayed. When Jesus was done on the earth, he ascended. God switched places with God. And now God indwells every believer. And to the same degree that Jesus turned the world upside down in the years of ministry is to the degree you and I are to turn the world upside down with the exception. We do not have the power to raise the dead and we do not have the power to make limbs grow. And don't believe anybody who calls themselves an apostle. And don't believe anybody who says, and isn't it amazing, they always raise the dead when they're by themselves. They want the media around when they're having big crusades, but don't put a, don't put a camera in the graveyard when we bring somebody back. So when you walk through, I'll get off that. That's for another time. Number three, tonight's Bible study aims to help every believer realize the importance of a private relationship. We're going to look at Acts chapter 1. A private relationship with the Holy Spirit. And please know this, here, here's, here's the, that component. And a spiritual relationship with those closest to you. This, I think, is the disconnect. It is the private relationship that you have with the Holy Spirit. And then the spiritual relationship that you have with those closest to you. What gives the believer credibility? We have to go back to the book of Acts. Go to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse number 14. It's right there. And when you talk about the day of Pentecost, and we're not trying to duplicate the numerics of Acts chapter 2, we're trying to find out how do we get the Holy Spirit to engage with our church in Acts chapter 2. 
And, and in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, the precursor, look at it. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Look at this, ladies. With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues, with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were all filled with with the Holy Ghost. There are two works that are being done that you need to really look at. Number one, the very first one here is your relationship, this private relationship with the Holy Spirit, right? And then a spiritual relationship with those, those closest to you. Could it be that we cannot be transparent in our faith with strangers and coworkers because we are not transparent in our faith with our spouse? Could it be that there is no credibility in the world around us because there's no credibility with the world within us? It's very easy. It's very easy for me to stand up here and preach to y'all. The hardest thing ever is when that lady sits on that second row right there and in that chair right there, and I know what I am saying better match up with how I'm living because the only person in this auditorium that knows it is that lady right there. There has to be a qualifier physically for your spirituality. And if dad, if I were to ask your children, how spiritual is your father? Wife, if I were to ask you, how spiritual is your husband? Husband, if I were to ask you, how spiritual is your wife? If I were to ask you, boyfriend, how spiritual is your girlfriend? If I were to ask you, girlfriend, how spiritual is your boyfriend? If I were to ask you, how spiritual is your dorm mate? How spiritual are those people you were in the car with? You see, there is this relationship that you have to reach up and grab hold on because it creates a momentum. The Bible says a three-fold cord is not soon broken. And the same thing that makes a gang mentality and the same thing that it says, who hath bewitched you, and the same thing that makes a, a sphere of people a driving force is the same thing that makes a church a driving force when the people sitting next to you, that they know you have a spiritual relationship, not only with the Holy Spirit, but you have one. Because Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 are all based on the premise of this. You ready? We're doing this together. We are going to get in a room together. And then we are going to be spiritual together. And then we're going to let the Holy Spirit have a relationship with us individually. This is what makes a marriage unstoppable. This is what makes a family unstoppable. And this is what makes a church unstoppable. If the only proof point of our Christianity is how well we sing here, then this is a sad church. And I'm a sad pastor. So number two. Number, number th number Four. Acts 2 has two settings. And this is where I started going on this study. Acts chapter 2 has two settings. What is happening in the house and outside of the house, right? So let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one what? Place. Referring, if you will, back to the house. Because you're going to find that in verse number 2. So we are not referring to what is happening in the temple. We are referring of what is happening in the house. Keep reading. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of the rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. If you go back to Acts chapter 1, they found this upper room. They found this place. They tarried there. And as they tarried there, together being spiritual... Then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God did a private work on them, and this is what was happening in the house. Letter A. Inside the house, the Holy Spirit was changing them. Inside this house, the Holy Spirit was changing them. It's very interesting to me, and, and, and I'm really kind of deliberately walking through without getting too animated as I would try to do on a Sunday night or Sunday morning. And let's just teach a little bit. 
I find it very interesting that you're not talking about a group of believers who are not committed. This is very important. You're not talking about a group of believers that were not committed to the risen Savior. They were not committed to being martyrs. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 where it says witnesses, martyrs if you will. They, they were committed. We'll die for him. Lord, will you set up your kingdom at this time? No. Why stand you here gazing, ye men of Galilee? And they said, fine. Then let's go to the upper room. Let's obey the Lord because... We're willing to die for him. We are going to be witnesses to the same end that he went to. So if that's where it takes us, that's how far we're going to witness for him. And then all of a sudden, we're not, they got to this upper room, and now the Lord has changed them. There's more than just saying, I'm committed to the Lord. I'm that Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I am this kind of believer. I am committed. It's more than that. At some point, the Holy Spirit has to change us. And that's what was happening in the house. Look, 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 look at letter B. Outside the house, men marveled. Can you write that down? Men marveled. That's the blank for 4B. Men marveled at the men whom the Spirit of God had changed. The, 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 the people... Well, don't, let me don't... I don't want to get ahead of myself. So look at verse number... Verse number Verse number five, and there was dwelling at Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Verse number seven, and they were all amazed and marveled. So understand that now these people were so changed in the house that the Bible says we're going to get to it, that it was noised abroad. Number five, the end of the Holy Spirit's moving in the house among the disciples was the salvation and sanctification of the lost. Okay, that's, that's, that's number five. The end of the Holy Spirit moving in the house among the disciples was the salvation and sanctification. We cannot reduce church to just the people getting saved. We must expand the gospel to the end of Acts chapter 2. Go to the end of Acts chapter 2 and look at verse 41. And, and I know this is very simplistic, and if I, am, if I am offending your refinement or your maturity, then I am so sorry. Not really, but number four, verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Salvation and baptism are not the end. They are a process to the continuation of the Great Commission. Because look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Very important we understand that. This is not available to us because we are not apostles. But I will tell you that Kevin that got baptized on Sunday... That's not the end of our church. We cannot just look at Kevin getting baptized and go, oh, no, no, no. Kevin's got a mama. Kevin's got a brother. Kevin's got neighbors. Kevin's got people that he knows. And what it's going to take is, is for God to so change him in his salvation. Baptism didn't do that. Jesus did that. But then change him in his sanctification. Because now the more that he is sanctified or whatever Kevin was before Christ should not be the Kevin after Christ. And the Kevin after Christ is what gives Christ credibility. Christ has already has credibility. Remember when, they raised, remember when he raised Lazarus from the dead? That they came to the feast, somebody help me, to see Jesus and Lazarus also. They came to see the one who raised them, but they wanted to see the one who was raised. There is no proof point for Christ whom they have not seen until there is a wonderful thing done in a man they used to know. And there is something wonderful. The end of what is going on, the end of everything I'm trying to teach tonight in the next couple of weeks is nothing more than this. Your private relationship with Christ to the point to where the men around you are like, 
I, I want to know more. And that when you open your mouth, things begin to happen. And that you leave an indelible imprint on everybody around you. I'm not talking spooky. I'm talking that the Lord knew exactly what he was doing out of the thousands and millions of situations he could have put in 66 books. He confined it and hand cherry picked to put Acts chapter 2 in there and put it exactly where he needed to put it because he knows if we're going to get this done in this church as they did in the early church, we have the same Holy Spirit. The world is just as lost. And there has to be a difference. And that difference is done by the Holy Spirit. Number six, number six, and this is the main point in my outline because that's why it's underlined. There was a spiritual relationship among believers. All that was introduction. Now let's get into it. There was a spiritual relationship among believers. I find, it, I find this very interesting. It goes much deeper than just um, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It goes much deeper than God bless our day. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse number 4. If you go to Acts chapter 1 and verse number 4. And being assembled together. This is so simplistic, don't crucify me. But you cannot have a relationship if you're not there to have that relationship. I find it very interesting that people's hearts who grow cold toward the church they are a member of is when they start spending more time in another assembly than they do this assembly. Be it soccer, be it Little League, be it fishing, be it bowling, be it hunting, be it the lake, be it this group of believers that are a hodgepodge of all kinds of membership, whatever assembly that you spend the time with in fellowship is the assembly's goal that you take on. This is why people get involved in Awanas. They're looking for something, right? This is why people get involved in clubs. They're looking for something. They're looking for an identity to get something accomplished. Let me tell you something. God already gave us an assembly to get something spiritually accomplished. You see, the gospel was not committed to the car club. The gospel was not committed to the bowling league. The gospel was not committed to just a group of unattached believers. The gospel was committed to the house of God. This is the vehicle that perpetuates the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the only vehicle that somebody can get baptized in. It's the only vehicle that somebody can take the Lord's Supper in. It's the only vehicle that can receive tithes and offerings. God knew what he was doing. And if you and I are going to just have this kind of impact, then you have to have this spiritual relate. But here's the problem. The problem is not the assembly. The problem sometimes is the relationship in the assembly. When is the last time that you prayed with a fellow believer when is the last time you shared? So what did this assembly look like? Go to verse number 14, if you will. In verse number 14 of Acts chapter 1. And they continued with one accord, and there's two things here. Prayer and what? Supplication. Okay? Prayer and supplication. So they, they had this connect, and, here, and here's why. It, 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 you're going to find that Jesus spoke much about the scriptures, right? You're going to find out that after this point, and, 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 and you're going to find that the scriptures start being introduced more and more and more. And the reason you hear preachers talk much about the Bible is because we now have the completed canon of the word of God. Now there's a more sure word of prophecy because Peter said, when I die and leave, then I can tell you what I saw. But there's a more sure word of prophecy coming, and that is the scriptures. 
Because now you've got the written word of God. You have the living word of God in here. You have the word that's in heaven as your savior. You, you, you and I have been blessed to have so much at our fingertips. And this is where God's given us the spiritual. I was sitting in my office and, um, and the door was open. It's raining. It's, it's just one of those kind of days. And, and t- today, while it was raining, I heard a couple of college students coming across, the, coming across the awning and trying to cut across. And they were singing. And they found that sweet spot under that awning that when they started singing a cappella, it was like, oh, man. Now, singing doesn't make them spiritual. Somebody was a little bit off. But anyways, but no, singing doesn't make them spiritual. But boy, what an attempt to be spiritual. You see, we have lost the fact this, the, I'm just going to, I have nothing to lose. We turn this into a business connect. We turn this into a dating parlor. We turn this into, hey, you got a rake I can use. And hey, you, you know, you got any real estate you want to dump on me? Hey, you got any, do, do you know what this is? This is that opportunity in the assembly to get spiritual. I'm not saying you should not. I'm not saying I'm not saying you shouldn't you, sh- you shouldn't help a brother when he's in need. Right? I'm not saying that. What I am saying is this: that the main part about the assembly is to be spiritual together. Bear ye one another burdens. Pray, supplicate. It's more than just okay. Let me pray for you. Dear Holy Father, no, no, supplication. Get in and go deep into whatever's going on, and get into prayer. How many know that there's surface prayer? And then there's deep prayer, right? My deep prayer for years was fall asleep. That's how deep my prayer went, amen? I thought it was funny. Number seven, number seven, there was a private working of the Holy, Go- working of the Holy Ghost. So there's not only this spiritual relationship that's going on, but now there's this private working, and you're going to find it in Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. Two things marked what was happening to them. Two things. One was the rushing mighty wind, And then letter B, or number two, there was the cloven tongues of fire. Cloven just simply means split. There was the rushing mighty wind, and then there was the cloven tongues of fire. But this was not a working that was being done in front of lost people. This is very important that we know this. This was not a work being done in front of lost people. This is where I separate from the non-denom and the contemporary Christian, this is where I separate from the Pentecostals on a major issue right here, and that is this. The Holy Spirit is not for a display to soothe your mysticism. Y'all get it? You see, this rushing mighty wind and this cloven tongues of fire was something that was done in the house, not in front of the world. And there's a lot of times that churches have to manipulate the spiritual side of a man. One of my pastor friends said, I'm going to make a statement, pastor, and and can you tell me if I'm off? I said, okay, talk to me. He said, everybody's spirit-filled. And I was like, oh, you got to qualify that one. He said, well, there's three spirits. There's the spirit of Christ, the spirit of man, and the spirit of the world. You're full of something. And I said, thank you for helping me in my Bible study. Please know this, that that when church, here's what we're trying. We're trying to take something that should be happening in our private life with our friends. And we're trying to make it a proof point publicly that God's alive in our service. A rushing mighty wind and cloven tongues was something that was being done privately. Letter B. Then they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, this is very interesting to me. Then they were filled with the Holy Ghost. We're talking about the Holy Spirit giving believability to the believer. Then they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Are you there? Page 2, letter B at the very top. The word is filled. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 27, if you will. And in my outline here that I have written down, it, I, I kind of got it backwards when I put it in I've got a qualifier notice in each of the verses and that's so let me read the verses first and and Matthew chapter 27 and look at verse number 48 for us to understand what does this word filled mean this word filled 
is, is not just fill a cup and let it sit. It's, it's not stagnant. Filled never has been stagnant. It, it never has been a static, okay? Um, um, look, look, look at, Matthew, let's let the word qualify it. Matthew chapter 27 and look at verse number 48, if you will. And straightway, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and what? Put it on a reed and what? Gave. Now, now let your mind go back to Acts chapter 2. There was the private working, this rushing mighty wind and this cloven tongue of fire. Let me stop and just say this. There will be times in your time with the Lord i got to be very careful here. There will be times in your time with the Lord, if you have not yet experienced it, that you will sit there and you will go, what just happened? When you talk that way, everybody around you is going, that happens to you too, Pastor? Like, what is going on? There's a... Holy Spirit of God that lives on the inside of you. And you cannot interact with the word of God on a consistent basis. And you cannot go to prayer with the deepest of groanings from Romans chapter 8 without you knowing. And this is why he said, wind and fire. John chapter 3. The spirit, listen, it blows wherever it wants to blow. And you can't stop it, and you can't fake it. How many know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, you sit there and you go, that was so comforting. Then you sit there and you go, that was so healing. Then you sit there and you go, I want more of this. And the thing that drives somebody back to the pea patch and drives somebody to the woods and drives somebody to this insatiable desire for the word is the Holy Spirit of God. And when it becomes real in your heart, then it drives you to action. Plug, outlet. When the Holy Spirit is real in your heart, it drives you to action. The Holy Spirit does not fill. And I use that word, we're fixing to look at another English word here. He does not fill the believer to stay in the upper room. Okay, look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 40. Now go to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, if you will. Luke chapter 4, verse 28. Just trying to help us understand the word filled here. And the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. So Luke chapter 4. And by the way, you can do these same kind of studies. Just simply get you e-sword, and, uh, or some type of thing that lets you know this word is used in these other verses. I'm not smarter than anybody else in this room. I'm just going to marry scripture with scripture, compare spiritual with spiritual, and let the Bible take you on its own journey. Look at, look at Luke chapter 4 and look at verse number 28. And all they were in the synagogue, and when they heard these things, were filled with what, please? Wrath. What's the punctuation? Comma. And rose up and thrust him out of the city. When you are filled, it drives you to action. When they had filled the sponge, then the gate. When they were filled with wrath, they had to do something. It wasn't sitting here going, nah, I don't know how I want to use this. No, no, no. It's filled. There's only one purpose we filled the sponge with is to give drink. There's only one reason they were filled with wrath because they were mad and now they're going to take care of the problem. When the Holy Spirit fills, but what, and as I looked at the Lord, I'm going to look up every verse that has to do with this word. If you would now go to Luke chapter 1 and verse 23. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 23. And there was another English word that really helped me understand. Okay, the word filled. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse number 23 talking about Luke chapter 1, about Zacharias. Look at verse 23. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were, what is this next word? Accomplished. 
That is the same word for filled. So the Holy Spirit filled them or the Holy Spirit now has accomplished in them everything he needs to accomplish in them. So now he will use them. Go to Luke chapter 2 and verse number 6. In Luke chapter 2 and verse number 6, same word as filled in Acts chapter 1. Luke chapter 2, Christmas story, birth of Jesus. To be taxed with Mary as a spouse, wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were, what please, accomplished that she should be delivered and she brought forth. Now the word accomplish is being used in the terms of being with child. Now we know. Nobody that's with child as that child grows and matures in the womb it just doesn't keep maturing in the womb. There comes a point that now you bring forth. When the Holy Spirit has accomplished, get out of his way, get ready, because now your life will bring forth. Bring forth what? When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, go back to Acts chapter 2, if you will, so we know that, they, that the, this work that was being done on them privately. So here they are all together. This private work's being done among this select few. They were filled. Let her see. The private work of the Holy Spirit is only done once he has filled or accomplished himself in you, which will result in action. I, I, I believe we live in a day and time to where... St- the spirit of the world is in competition with the spirit of God. These are great devices. But would we not agree that the screens in our life have not helped our relationship with the spirit of God? Because even if we're really working hard, how many times have we been using devices in a Christ-honoring way but then something pops up and something comes across and we have to very quickly wipe it away. The early church had no such distraction of the world. They still had the distraction of the flesh. They still had problems. Acts 4, the early church, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Ghost, right? Didn't even think, didn't even think twice about lying to the Holy Ghost. But in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit of God doesn't mean they were, they, were, they were more sanctified or holier than we are. It just means this, that we live in a day and time to where we're going to have to fight through the different spirits around us and understand the reason you and I, and I bring myself into this pot of believers, the reason we are ineffective in our words when we talk about Jesus Christ is because there is no private connect with the Spirit of God. There just isn't. And the only time we hear about them is when we come to church. The only time we read about them. The only time we get excited about them. We have to have revivals to get this done. We've got to have this to get this done. We have to have, and I'm not against any of that. But if you want those kind of days to be like amazing, then make every day, Holy Spirit, I want you to do that private work in me. I want to know you're here burn something down in my life, set something on fire in my life because of the fact that it will result in action. Letter eight, letter eight. Number eight, what in the world? There was a connection between the disciples and the lost. And I have six minutes to try to walk and I don't think I'm gonna rush as much as I want to. There was a connection between the disciples and the lost. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 5. Here is this distinction, right? So let's, let's give a distinction here. The lost did not have a connect with the Spirit of God. The lost only had a connect with the believers. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 5. It says this. Oh, I'm in to be taxed with Mary as a spouse ride. Let me get to Acts chapter 2. I'm like, he was taxed twice? All right, so here we go. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every, out of every, 
yes, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, look at verse number six, the multitude came together and were confounded because of the cloven tongues and the rushing mighty wind and the Holy Spirit of God. Is that what it says? Mm -mm. They were confounded because that every man heard who? Them. They, they never saw the mighty wind. They never saw the cloven tongues. It was just something that was noised abroad. Letter A, there was not a connection between the lost and the Holy Spirit. This is why we sit here, well, you know, Sunday's coming, the Holy Spirit will have his way. You, you, he will have his way. Absolutely. But how many could attest to this? At some point, God used somebody that was spirit-filled in your life to change you. How does that happen? Because somebody let him do something Holy Spirit-wise in them, and you never saw it. And the connection is between the believer and, and the masses. Letter B, the working of the Holy Spirit on the disciples gave them individual connection with the individuals among the masses. So that word fill in letter B is among. Acts 2, 6 through 8, all of a sudden, here are the disciples, the apostles, here are these men. And then here's all these people from all these different countries. And guess what? They were like, how do we hear them? And all of a sudden, in the middle of a mass, there's a connect. When God starts doing something in your life and in my life, you will become somebody's Ananias. You will become somebody's Paul. Somebody will be hooked to your wagon and they'll be standing there going, what do we do next? Like, like where do we go next? Like, like, what do we do next? Brother and Miss Kennard and uh, Julia and Joe, amazing. But how many times have they called you? And how many times they've called me? Said, hey, what about this? What about this? And every time they're out of town, like they're out of town, they're like, hey, Pastor, this is where we're at. This is what's going on. When the Spirit of God has so changed you privately, you'll have a connect with somebody. We cannot claim Holy Spirit fullness and then be loners in Christianity. It don't work that way. So I would ask you, I would ask me, because it's very easy for pastors to stand up and go, oh, look at me. I perform my little tricks three times a week for the congregation. Rather than, that's not my role. My role is the Holy Spirit is to change me. How did you get there? Okay, the Holy Spirit's to change me because you were just sitting back over there. I'm like, how did you do that? And uh, so the Holy Spirit is to change me. I got it now that's really working over time. Let her see. The lost never saw the rushing mighty wind or the cloven tongues. They knew something had been noised abroad. And I inadvertently put the plus in there. The lost never saw the rushing mighty wind or the cloven tongues. They knew something had been noised abroad. Verse number six. Would anybody else, I'm going to let you pipe up if you know where it's at. Anybody else know who else this was said about? That it was noised abroad? Who? Mark, you guys are good. You know what they said about Jesus? We weren't there when you performed the miracles, but we heard you've been doing something. It was noised abroad. And what the connotation here is this. The connotation was, what happened in that house? Hey, something happened in that house. It was so noised abroad that now they had to show up to the vicinity. They never saw the cloven tongues. They never felt the rushing mighty wind. But when them boys came out of there, they were speaking and acting different that everybody was going like, man, I get exactly what you're trying to say. How does that happen? Because of the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. We waste our mornings and we waste our evenings and we waste our lives giving into the spirit of self and the spirit of the world when the Holy Spirit envy, he lusteth to envy against the spirit of this world. And he says, man, I wish you loved me as much as you love that screen. If your Bible could record screen time, how would it compare to your iPhone screen time? 
You've had the Bible for 10 years and the pages still stick together. What's going on? When I say take your Bibles and turn, and I'm like, I bought that for a gift for you 15 years ago. Now I'm meddling. CHC1. Sound like a commercial. They were not witnesses of the working of the Holy Spirit. Witnesses. They were witnesses to the changed lives of the disciples. They were not witnesses to the working of the Holy Spirit. They were witnesses to the changed life of the disciples. Letter D is where I really wanted to get to, and I'll end. 8D. The lost do not understand our sanctification process, but they marvel at the results. If there's one statement that encapsulates, embodies everything I'm trying to say, it is this. The lost do not understand our sanctification process. They marvel at the results. Acts 2, 6, and 7. We've read it. They were confounded because they heard every one of them speak in his own language. They amazed and marveled, saying, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Illustration. Josiah and Malaya, I think they're up there in the booth. Are y'all, y'all raise your hands. Stop hugging up there. All right, okay. I only see one hand raised, Josiah. Okay, and uh, when, when we, <laughs> no, 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 that's Malaya's hand. All right, so, oh, okay, okay, I see you. What are y'all doing so far apart? Get the, all right, and um, when, they're married, by the way, so I better qualify that one. When we were doing their wedding, and uh, the workers, y'all remember, the workers were there, and, and, and we did the wedding. They wore their converses, and I thought that was cool. And I got a yellow pair out of it. I thought that was even better. And uh, we're staying in the reception, and the, and the two ladies were staying in the side. And, and, the, and the one lady said, hey, Pastor, did I hear you say correctly that that was the first time they held hands and kissed? And I said, yeah. Can I put it in the biblical vernacular? Behold, are not these young people in 2024, do they not understand that kissing is what you do before you get married because you've got to at least try out the lips before you marry them? Who does, who lives this kind of way? But yet you let me stand up in a stadium full of people and preach my sanctification to a lost world, they'll think I'm crazy. But they marvel and they are just like, have you ever said yes ma'am to somebody, y'all? They was like, who says that anymore? Like I'm 56 years of age and I was going through Starbucks. I was going through someplace up here and I said, thank you, ma'am. And, and Mackenzie looked at me and she said, don't call me, ma'am. You're old enough. I said, don't go there. Don't, don't go there. <laughs> the world loves the results. They do not understand the cloven tongues in the wind and they think that's the craziest thing. And that's why when we go, Fire. <laughs> Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and we'll end on this. <laughs> you know what? Do you see that plus? Do y'all see that plus? That's what that plus means. It's my own hieroglyphics in my notes. That fire. All right, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Here we go. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how it be it in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, and exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesy edifieth the church. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So even if tongues were still alive, which they're not, right, then here's the rule of thumb. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by what? Doctrine. 
Those are the four ways by which we prophesy. And even things without life giving sound, whether piped or harped, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So likewise, ye except ye, ye utter by tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. The Bible is very clear that when you and I do not operate according to the Spirit of God in private, and we try to pull this stuff out in public, they won't understand because it's such an uncertain sound. Here's why. Because it's blowing wherever it wants to blow. The Spirit of God's working in your life on a continuum. But when we come to the pulpit and we come to church, this is not the time to get mystical. This is the time to be very clear about what God's Word says. Very clear. And the world out there, joy, joy and, and Brandon... Oh, I gotta go. Joy and Brandon got married, and and Joy's co-workers were here, and um, and the co-workers. One of them said, "Oh, we love Joy. We love Joy." And by the time we got done with the wedding ceremony, one of them said, "That that was so refreshing to be at a wedding." And 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 they started heading down a path. I knew where they were going because listen to me, the world doesn't understand why don't I drink. Why, and I'm not saying they're worldly. I'm just saying that the world out there doesn't understand why I don't drink. They don't understand why I'm not Mormonistic in my women. I only have one. They don't understand why I act this way, why I don't go there, why I do that, why I don't do that, why. They don't get it. They don't get it. But boy, they love the respect. We're going to continue it. But your believability is not because you check boxes. Your believability is because of your relationship with the Holy Spirit of God. And I would ask you, what is it like privately with you and your God? Because if there is no private world, then don't expect credibility and don't expect believability. Thank you for taking the time to watch one of our services here at Emmanuel Baptist Church. And I would love to be a blessing to you. My number's at the bottom of the screen. And if you need anything, I would love to be of help any way I can. Again, thanks for watching. I hope the sermon was a blessing to you. And we will see you next time.